What's going on guys and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Garrett. I'm a seven figure Amazon seller showing you how you all can make a living off Amazon as well. In today's video, I'm taking you through a beginner's crash course of Keepa. Keepa is going to be the foundational element of how this Amazon business grows and is successful. So if you're just getting started in your Amazon journey, this is a video you're going to want to stay till the end too. So with that being said, stick around, we'll hop on my screen, I'll show you exactly what we're talking about. Our main focus today is, is really to begin to build out a fundamental understanding of what's going on within the product, within the data of a specific product. Right? I always like to say as Amazon sellers, we don't buy products, we buy data. Right? I don't care if it's a t-shirt, a toothbrush, or a comb, I'm buying the four to six months, the three months of data behind the product, right? the data that the product represents, rather than the product itself, right? So it's critical if we're ever going to buy a product for it to resell on Amazon. Before we do, we have to have a thorough understanding of everything that that product data is telling us because we can use that, again, to make the most accurate and most efficient sourcing decision we possibly can, right? And so as we start to build out this understanding, it's important to note that there's really going to be three specific uh, pillars when we're talking about the data of a product. And by pillars, we mean like the three aspects that are going on, the three aspects that we need to identify and understand and cumulatively piece that all together to understand what's going on within a product. And those three aspects are the buy box, right? The price, the market of the product, the demand of that specific product, and then the competition, right? The other offers of the sellers that are selling the same product. We have to understand all three because once we do, we can understand the product. And once we start to piece this whole picture together, right? Keep a provides all this information for us. And more importantly than providing the three data points, it provides the histor historics and the trending of those three data points. And just working from the top down, right, this top line chart is going to give us the historical trending of the buy box of a specific product. And for the beginners watching this video, what the buy box is, is it's essentially the featured offer under, under a specific product on Amazon, right? Amazon uh, offers and rewards one specific seller on a product listing as being the featured offer, right? As consumers, 80 to 90 percent, and that's an actual data point, 80 to 90 percent of all sales on Amazon happen through this buy now button, right? But that doesn't necessarily correlate to any specific seller. It's a rotation, right? Amazon rotates sellers through the buy now button. And again, that's where all the sales are going. So it's, it's, it, it stands to reason that we need to be obsessed with the buy now button, we need to be obsessed with the buy box price because that's where, again, all the sales are going to be and that's where we need to be competitive with in order, in order to be successful. So this is the current seller, but there's plenty of other sellers that will inevitably rotate through this buy now, this buy now button, and that's what this purple trending line represents. It represents the movement, the oscillation of where that buy now button currently sits. Um, and so we need to really understand the trending of that data point. The more kind of subdued the oscillation is, the more condensed that activity is, the better off and the more stable the price market is. Right? Because if we have a specific product that the buy now button, the buy box, is oscillating between 20 and 50 every week constantly, well, then we don't have as much confidence of where that specific price will be. Obviously, it's between 20 and 60, but I would much rather have a scenario like this where you know it's between one, it's between a certain price threshold where it's very consolidated, it's very predictable and dependable where that buy box is and where it will be because we can use that again to start to piece together our thorough understanding of the product. Now, that's the first piece, the buy box. The second piece is the sales rank, right? It represents the demand of a specific product. And now how to define a sales rank, it's, it's really um, a ranking mechanism of specific products, right? So uh, what Amazon, Amazon does with throughout its entire catalog is it kind of categorizes all of its products inside a catalog into categories, right? And so it has groceries, it has sports and outdoors, it has clothing, it has beauty products, health and household, right? Every category of products is ranked from one, being the fastest moving product inside that category, to the last the slowest mover in that category, right? And every category has different amounts of products in it. So there is no end point. There is no slowest moving product across all categories. It's going to be, you know, the 2,000 ranked in, or 2 millionth product in, cat in toys. It's going to be the 4 millionth product in grocery, right? However many products are in that category, that's the slowest mover. 
And so what a sales rank is, is taking into consideration all of the products inside that category. Amazon ranks them from one to the worst. And so the lower the sales rank, the more that product moves, the faster it moves, the more demand it has, right? And so we use that to identify the demand of a product. And, but, so, it's, and so sales rank doesn't actually necessarily correlate to a specific sales amount, right? So this doesn't mean it's selling 4,000 times or 5,000 times or whatever that number is. There's other there's softwares that kind of correlate that specific sales rank to an actual estimated sales per month. Um, a software is take that um, duty for us and we can use them to identify how many products, how many times we're going to sell a product. But again, just to understand sales rank is a relative mechanism of ranking from the first to the worst inside each category. But it's also worth noting, right, because each category doesn't have the same amount of products, a 4,000 ranked toy isn't going to move the same as a 4,000 ranked grocery, right? Because the product categories have different amounts of products, those two sales ranks don't necessarily mean the same thing. So, so we need to continue to build out our understanding of different categories. And again, SellRamp and, and as do other softwares, those help with that kind of understanding of the velocity. That's the second piece is demand of a specific product. Now the third piece, which goes hand in hand with the first two, the third aspect, the third pillar of these products, is competition, right? It's worth no. It's worth understanding, right? That anytime we're going to join a product market, we need to understand how many people we're competing against, and and what the um, historics of that competition were, right? If it's going up, or if it's going down, or if it has a, have a tendency to go up and down, or you know the under the trending of that historical offer count of the competition is super important to note, right? Because anytime, and we can see it in this um, in this chart. This the blue line represents the point in time offer count, the, the, the competition of a specific product. Um, and so it's important, it's super important to note that anytime the offer count's going up, the buy box is going to follow. Anytime you add competition, add supply to a market, well, that price is going to drop. Typically is the case because, you know, assuming the offer, assuming the supply is going up and assuming that the demand isn't really changing, right, it's, it's, usually the case where the demand of a product listing is going to be that unless it's seasonal or something like that right there's not a lot of demand changing within amazon and so assuming that demand holds as you as you apply as you um, add more supply to the market that price is going to come back down that's just kind of how economics work and so we can see that on display here the more offers that come into play that price starts to follow. So we have kind of two separate markets. And as the offer count starts to even out, it starts to be, get more steady, the price then follows, right? The price, the price becomes more steady as the offer count becomes more steady. So those typically are gonna be inversely related. That's why it's so important to identify the offer count trend, the competition trend, because if it ever starts to go up, that price is gonna go down. If the offer count goes down, that price is likely gonna go back up. And so again, that third piece of the puzzle, that third pillar is very, is very, is very important to understand um, how it's moving. Not necessarily what it is currently. I mean, although that is important, right? Because that's going to identify and kind of articulate how many units we could expect to sell per month. But again, the offer count trend is also very important because that's going to be using, um, that's going to be a forecasting tool to start to understand how our product will act in the future. So that's the basic, that's a very, very basic keep a graph, right? From a buy box perspective, how it's been operating in the past couple months, from an offer, from a demand perspective, how the sales rank starts to change, and ultimately and finally, how the offer count, how the competition is tra changing over time. Now we add more wrinkles to that entire discussion. The first wrinkle is when Amazon comes into play, right? Amazon's platform, um, they kind of hold the cards, and they also a lot of times come into play and sell products on their own platform. That's what this orange space represents, right? We can see if we if we look at that middle orange box, the, the lower orange box, we see that thirty nine ninety nine price point. That's representing that Amazon's in stock and active at thirty nine ninety nine. But the key point and the key takeaway from this specific graph is most often is the case where where and when Amazon comes in play, comes in stock, they often hold and hog the buy box, right? That's why we don't see that sort of oscillation. That's why we also see that purple line in sync with the orange line, right? We see the orange space come up to here. That's where Amazon's in stock. 
but that's also where the buy box is. And we can back that up if we go into the buy box statistics, the rotation. Amazon, we can see, is in stock 100% of the time of the buy box and owning the buy box 100% of the time. So that's the main reason, though, that we want to be always avoiding um, – typically always avoiding products where Amazon's in stock because that usually coincides with them owning the buy box, which then coincides with us not getting sales. That's what, not, that's what we're trying to avoid. The alternative right, to Amazon being, is, is being in stock is when Amazon is in stock but not owning the buy box, which is a good thing right? because the buy box, again, continuing to hound the point, and the buy box is the most important price point. That also overrides when Amazon's in stock and not claiming the buy box. For whatever reason, sometimes they come in play, Amazon comes in stock, and they don't own the buy box. We don't know why, but that's just how naturally it happens sometimes. And we don't need to kind of guess when that happens. We can see it in the data. We can see it in the graphs. We can see in a couple different scenarios right across the history um, dating back in the product where Amazon's in stock. We see them at forty nine ninety nine, but the buy box is down here at thirty two, thirty three, forty four. And that's completely fine, right? Because we don't necessarily care in this scenario that Amazon's in stock. We care that the buy box is at 32 and 33 and 34 because that's the main price point that we're always going to be focused on. And that holds true, right? They come in stock again, $49.99, um, and the buy box is down here at 34 44 actually, um, and oscillates across that. We can see also, right, where Amazon's out of stock. Anytime where the graph is white, where the orange space isn't, isn't there, that means Amazon's out of stock, right? So they're out of the picture. We don't care about them. They come in stock when it's orange. They go out of stock when it's white. But again, the most important piece and the most important listings are when um, Amazon is in stock and they're not owning the buy box. Now, to continue to add to that, right, it's not always going to be, you know, green light whenever we don't see that orange, orange space, right? There can be and there will be listings where Amazon's not in stock, but again, we still need to stay away, right? So ordinarily, right, and you probably hear me talk about this all the time, is that when buy box lines are very consolidated, very um, subdued in their movement, that's typically a good thing. Right, we can kind of relate this graph that we're looking into right here to the one we started with, right, where it's pretty subdued, it's pretty consolidated, the movement's not very it's, very, it's pretty subtle. Well, you would think, right, if the moving is very subtle, meaning it's flat, that would be a super, super good thing. Not the case, though. That's almost, um, and so anytime where the, the, the buy box is just simply not moving, it's unrealistic for it to be a, a, a very good scenario, right? There's a lot of smart Amazon sellers in the space. Uh, if this was a good product, people would find it. That's kind of the nature of the game. We can back that up, right? So if we go into the buy box rotation, we can see Yeti Authorized, which happens to be who this is. This is a Yeti product. Um, and so not getting into the whole Yeti, is it good to sell or not, right? Just from this specific graph perspective, um, we don't need to kind of get into hypotheticals. They're owning 100% of the buy box. So again, that's not something that we'd want to be taking part of. Anytime that the buy box is flat, it's usually meaning that one seller is holding and hogging the buy box, again, something that we're going to be wanting to avoid. The other scenario, which we'll get into a later video, is, is what's called a, a mapped product. Typically happens in the wholesale space where a brand kind of um, uh, asserts that a product is going to be sold at a specific price, and every third-party seller that is taking part in the market needs to abide by that specific product price. That's not this scenario. We can clearly see that one brand, Yeti, is selling the product. They're not sharing the buy box. So again, this isn't something that we're going to want to be taking part of. And so that's really wrapping up the fundamentals of what's going on with Keepa, right? We need to understand what the buy box price is. We need to understand where it's been, and we need to understand the activities surrounding the buy box. We also need to, we also need to understand the trending of the sales rank, right? Not necessarily correlating that to a specific estimated sales yet, right? That's a discussion for another day. We need to understand what it's been trending at because we can use that to, again, add to the story, add to the understanding of a product. And those two greatly coincide with the third piece, which is the competition. Competition, demand, buy box price, that com makes up the entire uh, fluency and understanding of a product data. Once we combine all those three, we then know what's going on inside a product market. That's going to be it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you did, feel free to like the video, comment, subscribe to the channel, and we will see you in the next video.